friends, good morning and welcome to church. Great to see you. Thank you so much for your patience with us this morning. It is lovely to see your faces or most of your faces. Um, a warm welcome to you if you are returning to church after a little while away. Great to see so many people here last week. Uh, but if you weren't able to be with us last week, we are so glad that you are with us today. Uh, you will notice we've got a couple of lights and a, a camera so that we can be connected with people at home. Hello to you at home. A little later on, Campbell will be speaking to us from the Gospel of John, chapter 14. And Jesus there is talking to his disciples just before his death. The timing of when he speaks is really important. It's just before his death. And there he speaks about a promised helper, the Holy Spirit. And here is what the Old Testament has to say about the Holy Spirit. I'll read to you from Joel chapter 2, verses 28 and 29. This prophecy says, And afterward I will pour out my Spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy, your old men will dream dreams, your young men will see visions, even my servants, both men and women, I'll pour out my spirit in those days. We live in the age of the Holy Spirit where God has given himself through the person of the Spirit so that we can follow after Christ. What a blessed time in which we live. For those of you who have been following the news this week, you will have noticed that Remembrance Day fell during the week. We're going to start our service by praying, and we're going to, I'm going to lead us in two prayers. One, a prayer of thanksgiving for those who have given their lives in defence of our country. And a second prayer based upon um, a prayer by Thomas Cranmer, who was um, significant in the establishment of the Anglican Church, a prayer for peace. So let's pray together. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we remember with thanksgiving those who made the supreme sacrifice for us in time of war. We pray that the offering of their lives may not have been in vain. By your grace, enable us this day to dedicate ourselves anew to the cause of justice, freedom and peace. And give us the wisdom and strength to build a better world for the honour and glory of your name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. A prayer for peace. Most merciful God, the grant of all peace and quietness, the giver of all good gifts, the defender of all nations who has willed all people to be accounted as our neighbours and commanded us to love them as ourselves and not to hate our enemies, but rather to wish them and also to do good to them if we can. Give to all of us a desire for peace, unity, quietness. We pray that we would grow weary of war, hostility and enmity, that we and they may, in one heart and charitable agreement, praise your most holy name and change our lives to live in accordance with your godly commandments. In Jesus' name we pray. And we're going to be doing a new thing in this season as well, which is a family spot, where we're going to be learning from the Bible together, both uh, grown-ups and children alike. And um, we're learning, um, the adults are learning from John's Gospel, and the kids are learning from John's Gospel as well. And we're thinking through some of the things that Jesus said, where he says, I am. And then he tells us something really important about himself. Okay, hands up if you have been in a blackout. Hands up. Oh, quite a few of you. So sometimes what happens is a telegraph pole or a tree knocks down a power pole, the lines go down, and there's no electricity in the house. And it's okay in the day, but it's particularly stressful at night because there is no light. Now, another question. Hands up if you know exactly where the torch lives in your house. Hands up. Hands down. Hands up if you don't know or care where the torch is because you'll just use your mobile phone torch. <laughs> Most of you. All right, okay. What I want you to do now is I want you to get your mobile phone out, right? And I want you to turn the torch on so we can see it. Oh, this is beautiful. I feel like this is the closest I've been to a U2 concert. It's amazing. <laughs> this is how you find your way because when it's a blackout, leave your, your uh, torches on. If your battery's low, you should have charged it. Uh, this is how you find your way because when it's dark, you've got to find your way through the house. Going downstairs can be very tricky. For some of us, going downstairs is tricky when the lights are on, let alone when the lights are off. For some of us, getting across the living room is tricky because there's Lego all over the floor. Kids, do you put your Lego away? No, I didn't think so. My kids certainly don't. But if the problem is this, and leave your lights on for just one more second, the problem is this. If we don't have a light to show us, then we're going to bump into things that will hurt us, tread onto things that will make us sore, 
and we won't be safe, which means we need a light. Okay, you can turn your lights off for now. Now, in the Bible, we read this. This is from the Old Testament. It's from Psalm 119, and it says, Your word is like a lamp that shows me the way. It is like a light that guides me. And so God's word is a little bit like a torch on a mobile phone that shows us the way to go. God's word is a little bit like one of those special headlamps that you wear when you're camping so you can know the way through the bush and back safely to the campsite. God's word helps us to stay on God's path. And if we don't have that, in life, we're going to bump into things that hurt us. That's what we call sin. And if we don't have that, then we will get lost. And God does not want us to get lost. He wants us, kids and grown-ups, to walk with God all the way safely home. And our home is called heaven. Now, the people in the Old Testament, they knew that. But then the Lord Jesus says something, and he says something really interesting, and he says something at a really interesting time. So, put your hands up if you've ever been to Vivid. You know, the, the one in the city where all the lights are and the opera house is a different color? Well, in the Old Testament, there was a vivid festival, but they didn't call it the vivid festival. They called it the Feast of Tabernacles. But during the Feast of Tabernacles, there were lights. Now, remember, back then, there was no electricity. So when it was dark, it was very dark. And Jerusalem, God's city, was built on the top of a hill. And what they did was everyone would hang lanterns outside their house. And at the top of the city was a great big temple. And in the temple, they would light these huge bowls filled with fire as lanterns, which meant from miles and miles and miles and miles and miles and miles around, you knew exactly where Jerusalem was because you could see the light at the top of the hill. And it meant that if you were on your way to Jerusalem, they called those people pilgrims because they were going to see the Lord at his house, the temple. They knew exactly the way to go. Now imagine that we're in Jerusalem and you can see the lights everywhere. And then Jesus says this in John chapter 8, verse 12. Jesus spoke to the people again. He said, I am the light of the world. Anyone who follows me will never walk in darkness. They will have that light. They will have life. Surrounded by lights, Jesus says, they're not lights. Call those lights. This is light. And he refers to himself. He says, I am the light of the world. Just in the same way that God's word helps us to stay safe from sin and to stay on the path with the Lord that leads us home to heaven, Jesus says, I am the light. If you are with me, I will keep you safe from bumping into things that hurt you. And I will keep you safe as we walk together home. If you want to stay safe, and if you want to walk on the path with God to heaven, then you don't need a mobile phone torch. You don't need a torch that's hidden under the sink. You need to stick with Jesus. Kids, Jesus is the light of the world. Stick with him. Grown-ups, well, same message for us. I'm going to say a little prayer. Father, we thank you so much that Jesus is the light of the world. We thank you that by sticking with him, we don't need to be afraid of sin or bumping into things that hurt us. We thank you that by sticking with him, that we know that we are walking safely on the path that leads us to the home that we long for, being in heaven with you. Amen. If you love me, keep my commands, and I will ask the Father... And he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, the spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans, I will come to you. Before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. On that day, you will realize that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love them and show myself to them. Then Judas, not Judas Iscariot, said, But Lord, why do you intend to show yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus replied, Anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My Father will love them, and we will come to them and make our home with them. 
Anyone who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. All this I have spoken while still with you. But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. <coughs> Excuse me. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. You heard me say, I am going away and I am coming back to you. If you loved me, you would be glad that I am going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. I have told you now before it happens, so that when it does happen, you will believe. I will not say much more to you, for the Prince of this world is coming. He has no hold over me, but he comes so that the world may learn that I love the Father and do exactly what my Father has commanded me. Come now, let us leave. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning, everyone. It's great to see you. And um, especially, welcome back. If this is your first week back after lockdown, really glad that you're here with us. Um, let me pray for us as we turn to God's word. Loving Father, thank you for giving us your word. We pray that now as we read it, we will find solace in it. And we will find encouragement in it. Uh, and we will um, uh, be buoyed up to live for you this week. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, uh, as Australian and state borders reopen, it hasn't been wonderful uh, to see the reunions at airports. Uh, you remember Hayden showed us a picture last week, and uh, it's just wonderful to see people reconnecting with each other after so long apart. And I guess the flip side is how hard it can be to say goodbye. Farewelling loved ones, even for a short time, can be really hard. Maybe for you it was farewelling a son or daughter heading off to uni in another place. Or perhaps uh, saying goodbye to your own parents as you've moved out of home. Or saying goodbye to loved ones who are moving overseas for an extended time. It's hard to say goodbye. And uh, maybe that's what's behind the popularity of songs like Leaving on a Jet Plane by Michael Robinson. Oh, it's not Michael Robinson, it's uh, John Denver. Um, you might not be a John Denver fan, uh, but that mournful refrain really sticks with you, doesn't it? Because I'm leaving on a jet plane, don't know when I'll be back again. And if you haven't heard John Denver's version, uh, you might have heard another. It's been covered dozens of times, and if you're still not sure, ask Michael Robinson for a version. We all know the sadness of saying goodbye to someone, whether it's a short time or a long time. And as Jesus continues talking to his disciples about his departure, their sadness is clear. And they're also a bit confused. And so Jesus sets out to answer their questions. And he tells them not to be troubled, not to be anxious. So how does that work? How can he say, on the one hand, I'm going, and on the other hand, but don't worry. Well, the answer is this. When Jesus goes, the Spirit comes. And so for them and for us, the question now is, what difference does the Holy Spirit make? What difference does the Holy Spirit make in our lives? Our lives that are so often busy and sometimes anxious and sometimes sad. In a world of trouble where we often long for Jesus' return, what difference does the Holy Spirit make? Our passage opens with some simple words from Jesus and yet words that maybe aren't so simple to put into practice. If you've got the passage open there, have a look at verse 15. Jesus says, If you love me, keep my commands. Being a disciple of Jesus is not complicated. Following Jesus, at one level, is straightforward. Love Jesus, do what he says. And yet, we all know that the path of Christian discipleship is often far from simple. 
uh, Jesus himself warns us elsewhere that it's a narrow path. It's not easy. But Jesus doesn't leave his disciples to their own devices. He's not like some kind of grand puzzle master who sets his followers an impossible task and then walks away to watch them trying to muddle through it. Far from it. He's a good and loving shepherd. And he promises, verse 16, to send an advocate. He says, and I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever. The word translated advocate comes from a Greek word, paraclete, which is an unusual word. And it's so unusual, in fact, that sometimes Bible translators don't translate it. They just give us the Greek word paraclete. But that doesn't help us much, does it? So let's dig around a little bit and see what the word actually means. So the NIV translates it as advocate. It has the sense of a counsellor, a legal representative, someone who stands up for you. Others translate it as guide or comforter or teacher. The most helpful thing is to see what Jesus himself says. And in verse 16, he says the role of the advocate is to help you and be with you forever. And then a bit further down in verse 26, Jesus clarifies that the advocate, as you might have guessed, is the Holy Spirit. So what we're talking about here is no less than the third person of the Trinity, God's Spirit. That's the promise for followers of Jesus. But there's another detail in verse 16 that tells us a lot about the advocate and who he is. And that is one word, another. Verse 16, I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate. The Holy Spirit is another advocate. He will be to the disciples as Jesus was when he was physically present with them. A helper and guide. A comforter and teacher. And so let's read on to see the blessings of the Spirit for believers. Not many of us love change. There are a few who thrive on it. But not many of us love it. And so for the, for the disciples to hear Jesus' words is hard because he's told them he has to go. He'll no longer be with them. Well, they need more to hold on to, more evidence, more proof that it's all going to be okay. And so Jesus teaches them and spells out the blessings of the Spirit for believers. The first blessing of the Spirit is union with Jesus. You see, because of the Holy Spirit, we are united with Jesus. It's the Spirit who, remember verse 16, will help you and be with you forever. And he's with you forever because, verse 17, he lives with you and will be in you. And so it is because of the work of the Spirit with the disciples, the presence of the Spirit in the disciples that Jesus can say in verse 18, I will not leave you as orphans, I will come to you. The presence of the Spirit with Jesus' people means that Jesus is present with his people. Jesus says in verse 20, on that day, meaning the day when the Spirit comes, on that day you will realise that I am in my Father and you are in me and I am in you. So you see, the first blessing of the Spirit is that we have union with Jesus. The disciples would no longer see him. We do not see him. But his presence with us is no less real. He is in us by his powerful Spirit. The second blessing of the Spirit for believers is union with the Father. Because we have the Spirit, we are united with God the Father. Look with me at verse 23. Jesus replied, Anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My Father will love them, and we will come to them and make our home with them. First, notice Jesus' instruction again. He says, Anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. 
Love me, love my teaching. Love me, love my word. Love me, do what I say. And second, do you see the outcome? Verse 23, my father will love them and we will come to them and make our home with them. Did you hear that? What an amazing, wonderful thing. God the Father will come and make his home with those who love the Son. This is what God's people have been waiting for. Through the years, God's people have been waiting for the promise to be fulfilled, the promise of God's presence with his people. Back in Exodus chapter 19, it's all the way back in the second book of the Bible in the Old Testament. God has rescued his people out of slavery in Egypt and he speaks to Moses on Mount Sinai and he has these majestic words for his people. You yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt and how I carried you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. Now, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all nations, you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. And over the years, as God's people failed to live God's way, the promise lingered. And eventually it became a promise for the end time, the age to come. So in the Old Testament prophecy of Ezekiel, God promises this in chapter 37. I will make a covenant of peace with them. It will be an everlasting covenant. I will establish them and increase their numbers. And I will put my sanctuary among them forever. My dwelling place will be with them. I will be their God and they will be my people. Jesus has come. The hope of the ages. The promise fulfilled. God is with his people and now, as Jesus prepares to go, he promises that he will continue to be with his people by his spirit. Just as Jesus has promised to prepare a place, for remember, in his father's house are many rooms, in the meantime, God will come and make himself at home in his people. The third blessing of the Spirit is help with obedient living. We're not left to our own devices, not left to figure it out for ourselves, just as well. Um, we know that obedience is important, not that we're saved by obedience. We're not made right with God by keeping commands, but by Jesus' blood, by God's free gift of forgiveness. And yet, we know that obedience matters. It is evidence of love. Verse 21, Jesus says, Whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love them and show myself to them. If you keep Jesus' commandments, your obedience is evidence of love. And remember verse 23, The Father makes his home in the one who loves Jesus. You see, the one who loves Jesus is indwelt by his Holy Spirit. And so this third blessing of the Spirit is help with obedient living. The fourth blessing of the Spirit is teaching. The Spirit will teach the disciples and remind them of Jesus' words. Uh, verse 26, But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. The work of the Holy Spirit is to teach the disciples all the things Jesus has said to them. And the Spirit's work in teaching and reminding these first disciples is so important because from that work comes the New Testament. You see, these disciples, these first witnesses of Jesus, were the ones behind the writing of the New Testament. But how did they remember? How did they recall Jesus' words to them over the time that he was with them? And more than that, how could they remember and write down the things he'd said that they didn't really understand at the time? Again and again, as we read the Gospels, 
we see the disciples working really hard to understand the things Jesus was saying to them. After all, who could foresee the events that were unfolding in their presence? There they are. They're following this man, Jesus, and it seems that he's also the Son of God. They watch as the blind see, as the lame walk, as sins are forgiven. And finally, they will watch as their Saviour is crucified and then rises again. How could they remember and write down the things that Jesus had said, even though they didn't understand them at the time? Well, because of the work of the Spirit, teaching, reminding. And so this fourth blessing of the Spirit is teaching. Teaching the disciples all that Jesus has said. And from the Spirit's teaching comes the New Testament. And we can be assured of the completeness of the New Testament. The Spirit has taught and reminded Jesus' disciples of all that they needed to record in Scripture. And so in Scripture, we have what we need. We don't look for new revelation, for new prophecy, for new words from God. Instead, by the Spirit's work in us, we search Scripture, which was written with the aid of his prompting and teaching. And in those scriptures, we find all we need to make us wise for salvation. The fifth blessing of the Spirit is peace. Though Jesus is going away from his disciples, he's leaving his peace with them. Verse 27, he says, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. Jesus knows his disciples well. And it's understandable that they'll be anxious. Their friend is leaving them. And he's more than a friend. He's their Lord and Master who they've walked with and, and talked with and they've marvelled at him as he's healed the sick and calmed storms. And they've watched in amazement as he's answered the condemnation of religious leaders with wisdom. And now he's leaving them. Jesus knows his disciples well and he understands that they're anxious. And yet he can say, do not let your hearts be troubled. And he can say it because he's not leaving them on their own. He's leaving his peace. Now, in this verse, the connection with the Holy Spirit is not explicit, but from the context, it's reasonable to draw the conclusion that it's the Holy Spirit who brings peace. And elsewhere in the New Testament, there's plenty of connections between the Holy Spirit and peace in the lives of believers. After all, remember the fruit of the Spirit. One of them is peace. In Galatians, love, joy, peace. And so often in Paul's letters, like in Colossians chapter 1, verse 1, they begin with a greeting like this, grace and peace to you from God our Father. And in the letter to the Philippians, Paul reminds us that the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, is there for believers. Does that mean we'll never be anxious? No. Does it mean we'll never need to be reminded of the peace we have in Jesus by his spirit? Again, no. There's a reason Jesus instructs his disciples in this way. He says, do not let your hearts be troubled because he knows that their hearts are troubled. And there will be times for us when our hearts are heavy, when we experience the pain of bereavement, or illness, or a broken relationship. And yet it's also true that in the midst of pain and trouble, in the middle of the storm, we can know the peace that Jesus brings. And he doesn't promise to deliver us from the trouble immediately, but he does promise to keep us safe through it. And we have the promise of the peace that Jesus leaves with us by his Holy Spirit.
Well, these blessings of the Spirit are important for us to get hold of. They're important for us to understand because when things get hard, our question might be a bit like Judas' question. In verse 22, Judas, not Judas Iscariot, John points out, uh, points out um, Judas Iscariot, of course, is the one who will betray Jesus. Just imagine having the same name as that guy. Uh, but uh, Judas says, verse 22, But Lord, why do you intend to show yourself to us and not to the world? It's becoming clear to them that Jesus is leaving them. But as he goes, he's leaving his spirit. And he'll reveal himself to them in ways they haven't yet understood. And so Judas says, why us and not everyone? Why this secret revealing? Because they naturally thought that the Messiah would come in glory and be revealed to everyone. And the whole world would see and every knee would bow to him as Lord. And so Judas wants to know, why aren't you just showing yourself to everyone? Why, why are you leaving us? Now, we might have a similar question. As we face the trials and troubles of life, why has Jesus left us? We know he's coming back, but can't he just come a little sooner? Why the delay? Why did he go in the first place? And the answer in part is this. Because of the blessings of the Spirit... It's because Jesus goes that we receive these blessings of the Spirit that we've been talking about. Union with the Father. Union with Jesus. Help with obedient living. The teaching of the Spirit. The peace of the Spirit. But to put it in a different way, Jesus leaves physically. But in his place, we get the Father, the Son and the Spirit. God makes his home in us. The presence of the glorious creator of the universe in us. The writer Tom Wright puts it this way. We will see him plain to the eye of faith. We will live with his new life. We will know the deepest theological knowledge of all. That he and the father are in each other. And that we are in him and he in us. And we will be joined to Jesus and the Father by an unbreakable bond of love. Aren't they lovely words? An unbreakable bond of love. The great blessing of the Spirit poured out on God's people has come. Hayden read it for us earlier from Joel chapter 2. And afterward I will pour out my Spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy... Your old men will dream dreams, your young men will see visions. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. The spirit has come and he brings unimaginable blessing for God's people. But Jesus has more to say to his followers. The joy of Jesus leaving is not just for them, but for him. Have a look at verse 28. You heard me say, I am going away and I am coming back to you. If you loved me, you would be glad that I am going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. There's a gentle rebuke here for them. For the disciples are so preoccupied with their own problems, their anxiety about Jesus' departure, that they can't see what it means for him. They should be glad. Because Jesus' departure means that he's going to be with the Father who has loved the Son from eternity. Jesus will leave his disciples. He'll go through the agony of the cross, bearing the sin of his people. He'll triumph over death and evil. And he will go to be with his Father. And all of this is for his joy and for our good. Because when he goes, Jesus leaves his spirit with all the blessings of the spirit for believers. Leaving is hard. Saying goodbye is hard. And we long for the day when Jesus returns and we see him face to face. But in the meantime, we're not orphans. We've not been abandoned. 
Jesus gives his spirit to his people. And so we have the blessings of the spirit. Friends, this is what Jesus promises his people. John 14 verse 23. Anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My father will love them and we will come to them and make our home with them. Let's pray. Loving God, without you, we are not able to please you. Mercifully grant that your Holy Spirit may in all things direct and rule our hearts through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We give thanks for God's word that in its fullness shows us Christ. We also give thanks that we can meet for in-person services and pray for those who are joining in worship via the online service. We pray for all members of Emmanuel Church as we seek to share Jesus with our friends, family and co-workers, that we would share the hope we have with boldness and humility. Lord, we pray that all people, including those with disabilities, would feel welcome and included at Emmanuel Church. We pray for our missionary partners today, praying specifically for the Hood family. We praise God that the student club, Newcastle Christian Students, was, was advised recently that the Uni Student Association has removed a requirement through affiliation, which effectively prohibited evangelism. We pray for the National Training Event Conference coming up in December. Nick will be leading a team from across the regional New South Wales universities to pull this together. We pray for the family as they tr transition to new patterns of life with lockdowns ending. Lord, we pray for those amongst our church family that have asked for prayer support. Comfort and sustain them, Lord, during their difficult times. We name people known to us in our hearts now and for those named in the churches in use. We pray for the ministry team here at Emmanuel Church, for activities resuming in coming weeks. We pray for closer connections to be established and for energy and sustenance for the leadership teams. We pray for students currently sitting their HSC exams. Be with them, Lord. Calm their hearts and their minds and enable them to do their best under stressful circumstances. Lord, we confess that we do not always follow your way. Help each of us to follow you closely, to read your word and make time in our daily lives to spend time in prayer and devotion. We ask that you guide and direct our lives each day. Lord, hear our prayers. Amen. Thank you for joining with us today. Uh, thank you for joining with us today in the Protective Environment Room. Thank you for joining with us today, those of you joining us at home. It is a source of great sadness when someone goes away. And the Lord Jesus is returning to the Father. And the Lord Jesus will reign from the Father's right hand. And he promises that he will come and restore all things. But it is a great source of sadness when someone whom we love goes away. And yet the Lord Jesus gives such comfort. Because he says, though he is going, he will send another helper. And Jesus says, anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My father will love them and we will come to them and make our home with them. I'll conclude with these words. Lord God, we rejoice in your greatness and power, your patience and love, your mercy and justice. Enable us by your Holy Spirit to honour you in our thoughts, words and actions and to serve you in every aspect of our lives. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. God bless you. We'll see you next week.